Welcome to Mexico Unexplained, where we will explore the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. This series presents information based partly on theory and conjecture. The podcaster's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones to the subjects we will examine. Here is your host, Robert Bito. Welcome, and muy bienvenidos to episode number 265 of Mexico Unexplained, where we examine the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. I'm your host, Robert Bito. 24-year-old Henri de Saussure left his home in Geneva, Switzerland to undertake a grand adventure. The year was 1854. Saussure was already an accomplished entomologist, one who studies insects, with a special fascination for the order Hymenoptera, which includes wasps, bees, and ants. The young Swiss scholar was also a trained mineralogist. He left Europe on a multi-year expedition to collect insects and started in the Caribbean before heading to Mexico and then the United States. Saussure found himself in a remote part of the Mexican state of Puebla in 1855 in the semi-arid highlands. In his detailed journals, he claimed to have discovered a very large lost city about 60 miles northeast of the city of Puebla, which had formidable walled fortifications, well-planned streets, and monumental architecture, typical of many other ancient Mesoamerican sites. As he noted various pits and trenches dug by looters, Saussure was not the first person to set foot in this vast archaeological zone. In fact, he called the place Canton, after hearing people living nearby the site call it Cantona, Caltonal or Caltonac. The latter two names come from combining two words from the ancient Aztec language Nahuatl, Kali or house, and Tonali meaning sun, so essentially the name of the site means house of the sun. The variations of the present name, Cantona, were by no means what the early inhabitants of this place called their city. As there have been no written records discovered at the site, and no identifiable references to Cantona by other cultures in ancient Mexico, modern people have no idea what the ancients called this place. By the time the Aztecs had arrived in the area, the site had long since been abandoned, and they must have assigned the name Caltonal or Caltonac to this place much as they had given names to other ruined cities like Teotihuacan. The site now known as Cantona did not appear in any Spanish colonial documents because it was so remote and no one was living in the ruined city at the time of the European arrival, not even squatters. It is only briefly mentioned in an obscure 1790 geographical dictionary of New Spain with no details given. So, the credit of sharing Cantona with the wider world can be given to the Swiss bug expert who published the notes of his journeys when he returned to Europe. No one besides occasional treasure hunters took any serious interest in the site between Saussan's visit and the early 1900s. It was then when Mexican researcher Nicolas Leon, using Henri Saussan's notes, arrived at Cantona and described, in detail, its structures and other surface features. In 1903, he published a text called The Archaeological Monuments in Cantona, but it generated little interest. It would be almost 60 years before anyone else paid any attention to this remote set of ruins. In the early 1960s, Paris-born Mexican architect Paul Gendrop took hundreds of photos of the site and made exhaustive measurements of structures at Cantona. At around the same time, Mexican archaeologist Eduardo Noguera conducted research at the site, specifically concentrating on ceramics. More work occurred here in the 1980s with the idea in mind to prep Cantona for tourists. Cantona underwent its first large-scale excavations in 1992, sponsored by Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History, under the direction of Ángel García Cook and Beatriz Leonor Merino Carrión. 
Cantona is open to the general public today, but sees very few visitors. In fact, people who live in towns just a few miles away know very little about what is in their very own backyard. Archaeologists and other researchers divide the history of Cantona into four phases spanning about 2,000 years. The pre-Cantona phase took place between about 1000 BC and 600 BC. During this time, there were a few small villages at the 12 square kilometer site, but no stone buildings of any kind. Ceramic artifacts associated with this phase indicate that Cantona's original inhabitants came from the Tehuacan Valley to the south and the valleys of Tlaxcala to the site's immediate west. In the latter part of this phase, around 750 AD, the settlements at Cantona became denser and more urban, with adjoining houses being built. Also, the inhabitants of Cantona began building roads to connect the settlements at the site with each other and with the villages farther away. It was near the end of this phase in the 7th century BC that the people of Cantona began exploiting the obsidian resources of the nearby Saragossa Oyameles Mountains. This drew much attention to the growing population center, and with the flow of obsidian through Cantona came more wealth and more social and political stratification. Researchers give the name Cantona I to the phase at the site dating from 600 BC to 50 AD. During this time, the city exploded in population, and the people of Cantona built much of the massive buildings still visible today. During phase one, Cantona became one of the largest cities in ancient Mexico, even rivaling the central Mexican powerhouse Teotihuacan to the west. Archaeologists believe that during this time the city drew people from the Gulf Coast of Veracruz and the Mexican highlands. Cantona's trade networks extended for hundreds of miles. Because of threats of invasion from various foreign powers interested in taking over the vast trade networks, the rulers of Cantona constructed elaborate and extensive fortifications and a rigid system of city streets and roads extending away from the city. The city saw a building frenzy during Phase 1 to include plazas, pyramids, and ball courts. Some archaeologists believe that during this time, the city had a population of 80,000, and with such a dynamic and diverse population, there was intense craft specialization, as evidenced by the many workshops uncovered. There was also great social stratification, with a very wealthy ruling elite at the top. Some researchers believe that Cantona was such a great regional power in the years straddling B.C. and A.D., that it helped cause the downfall of Teotihuacan by denying it valuable obsidian and by cutting it off from its access to Gulf Coast trading areas and even trade with the lucrative Maya civilization. For more information about Teotihuacan, please see Mexico Unexplained episode number 45. The Cantona I phase shifted to the Cantona II phase around 50 AD. This phase lasted until around 600 AD. This was the time during which Cantona reached its peak. In the early centuries AD, the building at Cantona intensified. During this phase, the rulers of Cantona constructed some 20 ball courts and the temples were expanded. Luxury goods found at the site indicate that during this time, Cantona had contact with both the Pacific and Gulf coasts the Maya lowlands all the way into modern-day Guatemala, and at least secondary contact with turquoise mines located in the modern American state of New Mexico. Cantona's major export, as it had been for hundreds of years, was obsidian, but in Phase two, it also exported many handcrafted products and agricultural products as well. Closer to the end of the Cantona II phase, the building of fortifications became more intense as if the people of this massive city were trying desperately to defend themselves against a very persistent or powerful enemy. 
the Cantona III phase beginning around 600 AD and lasting until about 950 AD, sees an even more desperate attempt by the city to defend itself. It was during this period that a military elite took control of the city and human sacrifices increased. This change in governmental authority was a reaction to many external pressures and some of the internal pressures coming from its high population and dense urbanization. During this more militaristic phase, art ceased to be made at Cantona, along with the creation of religious figurines and effigies. The city, it seems, was in some serious trouble. The last phase of the Cantona chronology was brief and lasted from about 950 to about 1050 AD. Called Cantona IV, this phase dealt mostly with the site's abandonment. A series of droughts and invasions from northern Chichimec tribes caused people to lose faith in the government. During this century or so of Phase IV, the city's population plummeted to only a few thousand people. The Chichimeca invaders, who seemed to torment the remaining people at Cantona with their successive raids, had no desire to take over the city or to populate it with their own people. By 1050 AD, Cantona was completely abandoned. So what does the current archaeological site of Cantona look like? It's important to note that only 1 to 10 percent of the site has been excavated, but much of the monumental architecture and the city's main buildings, walls, platforms, and pyramids have been cleared of the high desert scrub plants that took over after its abandonment. Only a small portion of the site's 12 square kilometers is open to tourists. Nothing at Cantona was built with mortar or plaster, series of carved stones were stacked one on top another to form even the largest buildings. The Acropolis is located on Cantona's highest point, where the elites lived and where the bulk of the important civic ceremonial buildings are found. The city has an intricate network of some 500 narrow walkways that controlled foot traffic within Cantona. The largest road called First Avenue by archaeologists stretches some 1,840 feet long. Besides the low pyramids and public plazas, some 3,000 individual patios have been identified, which helps researchers to estimate population. The most stunning feature of the site must be the high and thick walls used to defend the city. Also, to date, archaeologists have uncovered 27 ball courts at Cantona, most of them located near the center of the city. Of special note is a miniature ball court, about a third of the size of the average size of a court at Cantona. Some researchers believe that it served some ritual purpose, while others believe it was a special training center for small children. A more fringe theory entertains the idea that this tiny ball court was reserved for dwarfs, but there were most likely not enough dwarfs in the region to field two ball court teams. For more information about the Mesoamerican ball game, please see Mexico Unexplained episode number 53. Attached to the Cantona archaeological zone is the nearby Tsinaka Mozak cave, which has drawn a lot of attention from researchers. The four and a half mile long lava tube in the side of a volcanic hill called the Los Humeros Caldera contains an interesting artificial rock structure on the cave floor underneath a natural skylight. The structure includes a pentagon shaped enclosure around a central mound which is topped by a basalt slab resembling an altar. Detailed measurements and computer modeling indicate that this was used as an astronomical observatory and was tied to the Mesoamerican calendar. No artifacts have yet been found in this cave, and no one knows if this unique observatory predates the settlement of Cantona or what role it played in the religious or civic life of the city. Exactly who built this deep inside the lava tube remains a mystery. The ancient city of Cantona dominated the eastern area of Mexico for many centuries, had a massive population, 
and played a significant role in the history of ancient Mexico. Very few people have even heard of this important place, and much research is yet to be done here to unravel Cantona's many mysteries. Thank you once again for listening to another episode of Mexico Unexplained. Remember to like and subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Twitter. Tell your friends by sharing these shows with others. Please go to our website, MexicoUnexplained.com, for references, illustrations, and for free access to transcripts of past shows. Please visit Amazon.com to purchase the books, Mexico Unexplained and Mexican Monsters, to get hard copies of The Magic, The Mysteries, and The Miracles of Mexico. We appreciate your kind attention once again. Until next time, thank you. Gracias. Thank you for listening to another episode of Mexico Unexplained with host Robert Bitto. For show summary, relevant links and commentary, please check out our website at mexicounexplained.com. Like us on Facebook and be a part of the conversation. Adios and hasta la vista.